Hi. Well, welcome everybody. Good seeing you here. I did work here like a hundred years ago. And so uh, it's good to be back, but I'm part of the church. I'm here. I'm here every week. And I want to welcome everybody in the auditorium here, in the atrium, all of those that are joining us online from all over. Welcome. You're always so welcome here at Crossroads. And today we're continuing that series, Bending Our Hearts. Uh, it's going to carry us all the way to Easter. It's our Lenten series here at Crossroads. And our lead pastor, Ryan Howell, kicked it off last week with a great message. If you weren't here or you haven't watched it, watch it online, catch up. And he gave us uh, some big challenges. And one was to memorize the anchor verse of the series. It's Psalm 119, 36 through 37. It's a little prayer right in the middle of Psalm 119. And I know maybe if you're like me, we're a little uh, memorizing challenged. And so I thought, well, let's say it, but let's put it up on the screen. Okay, is that all right with everybody? But if you memorized it, we want to give you credit for that, and you can close your eyes. <laughs> but let's say this out loud together, this anchor verse of the series. Here we go. Bend my heart toward your instruction and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. With your ways, give me life. And it's a prayer as you catch it there. It's a prayer. Let's say it once more. Uh, here we go. Bend my heart towards your instruction and not towards selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things with your ways. Give me life. Or as Ryan said, give me wholeness. And last week he talked about bending our hearts towards repentance and turn our eyes away from worthless things like he talked about guilt and shame that do not bring us life. And I'm picking up this idea this week, only I'm talking about some different topics that Ryan gave me to talk about. And we're going to talk, deal with the issue of, and you can write this down if you're a note taker, we're going to deal with the issue of superiority, feelings of superiority or pride, which by the way, I don't know if you've noticed this, but sometimes church people seem to wrestle with this. And I consider myself a church person. So I'm in the boat with everybody else. But we're going to ask God this. We're going to say, God, bend my heart towards humility and turn my eyes away from worthless things like feelings of superiority, feelings of pride, those kinds of things. And social scientists, they tell us it's better to br actually brag about yourself than to do the humble brag. You know what the humble brag is? Somebody is acting like they're humble. They may even say they're humble, but you get it. They're really just pointing out their own accomplishments, right? And so they say, don't do that. Don't do that. That's the lesson. Don't humble brag. Don't fake humility. False humility stinks worse than pride. Somebody said humility is like underwear. It's essential, but inappropriate if it's seen. Somebody else said, if you act too big for your britches, you'll get exposed in the end. <laughs> See, I'm a dad. I'm a grandfather. I can tell these kind of jokes. I've earned it. That's right. But don't confuse this pride we're going to talk about with feelings of self-worth or having a positive self-image. Uh, we should all have a positive self-image. I hope you do. I mean, every single one of us created in the image of God. You're a reflection of God. God has given you gifts and talents and abilities to make the world a better place. And if you're using your gifts and talents and abilities to lift people up, you should feel proud of that. You should feel good about that. In fact, our, that's what our team that went to Puerto Rico did. How many people are here that are on that Puerto Rican team that went? Raise your hand up. Oh, let's hear it for these people. I mean, they should feel proud using their gifts to help people. We should feel proud as a church that we send people to do that kind of thing. And also that our church here at Crossroads stands for kindness and love, generosity, inclusivity, and uh, peacemaking. We should feel proud of that. I am proud that that's the kind of church we are here 
at crossroads. But that's not the pride we're talking about today. The pride I'm talking about is that inner desire to, you know, be superior to other people, to project you know more, have more, you're prettier than, stronger than, more knowledgeable than somebody else. That's the pride we're talking about today. And the wisdom from Scripture on this, it's going to come from a very familiar parable of Jesus. This parable we're going to look at today, it ranks right up there with Jesus' most known, most loved parables, like the Good Samaritan or the Prodigal Son. Parable I'm going to talk about, it's the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee and the tax collector. So let's jump into this. I mean, you couldn't find two people that were further apart than a Pharisee and a tax collector. If you're taking notes, you're right. The Pharisees were at the top. They were at the top of the religious ladder. They were supposedly the ones that were most acceptable to God. Tax collectors, on the other hand, they're at the bottom. They're at the bottom. They were hated. They were despised. People would cross the street to get away from a tax collector. Much different than how we think of the IRS today. You know. We love them, right? Well, this is a story, this is a story, this parable, of two bitter enemies. And they meet, but they don't meet on a battlefield. They meet in a church. And it's found in Luke 18, 9 through 14. I think we have it up on the screen. It's not printed there, but you could just listen to this. Some of you would have heard this before, but I'm going to read it. Listen to this. Jesus says, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Then Jesus adds this, I tell you, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. And to help us understand this parable, we got to understand the audience a little bit. Jesus began, he said, to some, there's all kinds of people in the crowd that he's talking to, but there were some, and he adds this statement, who were confident of their own righteousness. They knew they were righteous. They're self-righteous. These were people of power and authority, respect. They were looked up to by everybody as spiritual giants. And that's how they looked at themselves, spiritual giants. But they looked down on everyone else, especially the so-called, you know, outcasts, the rejects, the spiritual zeros that Jesus kept giving himself to and hanging out with. And this is what pride can do. You could write this down. Pride gives us a distorted view of ourselves and can cause us to look down on others. That's the danger of pride right there. We don't see ourselves for who we are, really, and we look down on other people. And part of what Jesus came to do was redefine what righteousness is all about. Righteousness as Jesus taught it and modeled it, It was a heart that genuinely loved God and loved people. That was righteousness. That's the bottom line of righteousness. Loving God and loving people. And let me just say, we can't love God if we don't love people. You can't love God who we don't see if we don't love people right beside us that we do see. And if we get this wrong, it's deadly. I mean, you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and You see the sense of superiority or self-righteousness drew sharper criticism from Jesus than just about anything. And here's something important to remember. Always remember this. A lot of sinners flock to Jesus. Self-righteous people, they didn't flock to Jesus. 
Sinners flocked to Jesus. People that were guilty about all kinds of bad sins, sexual sin, financial sins, all the rest, they flocked to Jesus. Think about it. You never read where a self-righteous person flocked to Jesus. And so Jesus deliberately tells a parable in a public setting where the character who represents the spiritual giants, he turns out to be the bad guy. And the guy that represents the spiritual zeros ends up being the hero. And understand, get this, this is not some little pleasant story Jesus is telling. He didn't pull out the flannel graph and everybody sit in a circle and gave him a big smile. Not at all. Jesus was getting right in the face of a very powerful group of religious and civic leaders. When Jesus told this, he was looking for serious trouble when he told this parable. Spiritual giants in the crowd, they're getting so offended. Spiritual giants were so offended by this parable, they wanted to kill him. And one day they would kill him for telling parables just like this one. And on the other hand, the spiritual zeros in the crowd, the sinners, they're listening to Jesus tell this, their mouths are hanging open. They're going, I can't believe he's saying this. Can you believe he's saying this? Tax collectors in the crowd are going nuts. They're going, a, a story where a tax collector's not the butt of a joke? And isn't the bad guy unbelievable? Jesus telling a story where a tax collector's a hero? Nobody tells a story where a tax collector's a hero. No wonder I love this guy. That's what they're thinking right here. And why does Jesus do it? Why does he get ruthlessly in the face of the most powerful people of the day? I'll tell you one reason. One reason. Because when it comes to feelings of superiority and pride, we're dealing with a problem here. Our topic here, this is a problem that is uniquely difficult for people to see in themselves, for us to see in ourselves. That's what it is. Funny thing, I was thinking about this on Thursday. I'm thinking on Thursday. People will, you know, they'll, they'll see therapists, counselors, they'll go to pastors, because they got an anger problem. They know if they, don't, if they don't get their anger under control, that lashing out's gonna destroy relationships. I thought, people suffer from anxiety and fear, they go to counseling every day because they're dying on the inside. They got to get help. I'm thinking people have all kinds of addictions. You know, they're in support groups, recovery groups, 12-step groups. They'll pour out every embarrassing detail of their life because they know if they don't come clean, it's death for them. And I'm thinking all this, and I'm thinking all these topics, bitterness, anger, anxiety, addiction, every one of them has treatment centers to help people. Here's, what, here's what's interesting. I've never known a counselor, a therapist, or a pastor. I was a pastor over 30 years. I've never known anybody that ever has had a person come to them and say, hey, could you help me with my pride problem? Never one. No. Another thing, I, th I think of this. I go, you know, there's, you know, all these things have treatment centers for them. I mean, there's no Be Betty Ford treatment center for the unbearably arrogant. I mean, wouldn't that be good? Wouldn't, you, wouldn't that be great? If there was a treatment center for the unbearably arrogant, you know, don't you know a few people you'd like to go to that thing? And I'm also thinking, you know who the people I think could use it most? It wouldn't be holiday, Hollywood celebrities. I don't think so. I don't think it's rock stars. I don't think it's professional athletes. You know, I think sometimes it would include, include people like us, uh, church people, people who call themselves Christians, you know, who shake their head, you know, in disgust at a society where people can't be as upright and pure as we are. Here's another irony. Another irony. Many Christians read this parable. You know what I think a lot of them say? They go, man, thank God I'm not like that tax collector. 
Not like a tax collector. Thank God I'm not like a Pharisee. You know, thank God I'm not like the Pharisee who said, thank God I'm not like the tax collector. You know, thank God I'm not like that self-righteous judgmental Pharisee. Thank God I'm superior to that guy that thought he was superior to everybody. (laughs) And here's here's something else, back to the parable. In their day, we have to remember, Pharisees were highly regarded in that day. Very highly regarded. They were at the top of the religious system. Never more than 3,000 at one time. But if there was one thing Jesus despised and came down on more than anything else, it's one thing every Pharisee, every Pharisee majored in. Pride, self-righteousness. Looking good and looking down their nose at other people. Here's another detail, verse 10, if you read this on your own. That, the parable I read. The two men go to the temple to pray. That would have sounded different to people that were listening than to us today. We think, oh, these two guys just happened to go to the temple to pray. Private, personal, spiritual experience, you know. They just happened to run into each other there. That's not what the listeners would have thought of. They knew Jesus was talking about those two times a day when people went to the temple to pray, nine in the morning and also at three in the afternoon. Lots of people were there. Many people were there. That was not a private, personal experience. It was a public thing, a public service. And they would pray, and they would pray out loud. So the Pharisee, Jesus says the Pharisee stands up. Verse 11, Pharisee stood up by himself and prayed. In other words, it says by himself. He separated himself from the mass of people that would have been there. He put, moves way over to one side, away from everybody. Pharisee did that because if somebody bumped into him, if somebody touched him accidentally, it would defile him. He's a holy man. And the people would understand that. He's a holy man. He so he separates himself. People see that, they're not shocked. Oh, he's a Pharisee, he's a holy man. And he acts like he's praying to God. He acts like he's praying to God. But he prayed about himself. He wasn't praying to God. He said, God, I thank you. I'm not like other people. I'm not a robber, evildoer, adulterer, even like this low-life tax collector over here. He acts like he's praying to God. He didn't have his eyes on God. He had his eyes on himself. And pride does that. Write this down. Pride keeps our eyes on ourself. That's what it does. Jewish prayers, by the way, generally were thanking God for what God had done in a person's life or praying for their needs. This guy doesn't do that. He says, God, thank you, I'm not like other people. You know, thank you, I'm not a robber. I don't steal. I'm not an evildoer. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not like a tax collector. Have you ever heard anybody pray and you can kind of get the idea that they're... Praying out loud, but they're using prayer to send a message to somebody that's there, you know. They're not really praying to God. You ever experience that? They're sending a message through their prayer to somebody else that's right there. You know, oh God, my spouse, my spouse, my husband, my partner that's listening right now, even as you and I speak, help that person to have victory over their selfish, inconsiderate ways. Help them to buy me a good birthday gift. God, you know where it is, Lord. You know where it is. It's a Lululemon. Go in the front door, all the way to the back. It's right there. It's a matching outfit, hoodie and pants. Person's not talking to God. No, Pharisee's not talking to God. And let's admit something else here. Let's just be honest. Truth is, most of us have a hard time admitting our mistakes and failures. You know, we see it, I could see it in other people. But to admit it ourselves or to notice it in ourselves, it's tough. So we're quick to judge like the Pharisee, but, you know, we don't see it in ourselves, just like the Pharisee didn't. A while back, I was picking up dinner. You know, it's kind of embarrassing to say, but I'm picking up dinner. I'm going to Chipotle and 
You know, it's healthy, natural, it's always fresh, and no artificial fillers or, you know, anything like that, flavors, nothing. You know, it's, it's from farmers, right? Not factories, uh, animals raised outdoors, you know, no, no antibiotics, synthor, synthetic hormones. My wife, Phyllis, made sure we always ate healthy. Now I'm eating, trying to eat healthy, so I'm going into Chipotle, and I walk in. I'm going to get a burrito bowl, black beans, you know, uh, I'm going to have lettuce on it, chicken, guacamole. I'm going to get a bag of chips and a large Pepsi. And I look across the parking lot, across the parking lot, there's Wendy's. Bunch of people going into Wendy's. I'm going, what? Is, you know what? What's wrong with people? Going into Wendy's? What, are they going to worship the little pig, red-haired girl with the pigtails? I mean, what are people thinking? Probably going in there, going to order a double, triple cheeseburger, supersized fries, milkshake, all of that. I'm thinking this to myself. What's the matter with people? Don't they know that stuff's got saturated trans fats? You know, it's all processed. It's like injecting sodium right in your bloodstream. That food ought to come with a cholesterol pill. How can people eat like that? Don't they have any self-control? I'm thinking this to myself. Even though the Monday before, I got a cheeseburger, fries, and an ice cream cone down Eisenhower. I do that like about once a week. We don't see it in ourselves. There's a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. I don't think about when I judge someone. A lot of things. I don't think about the person I'm judging. Like maybe they had a much harder background than I had. I don't think about that. I don't think about maybe they had a, maybe I had a whole lot more, uh, you know, moral, uh, emotional, relational, personal support than they had growing up. I don't think about genetic predispositions they might be dealing with wiring problems and ADHD, anxiety disorder, depression, stuff like that. I, just, I don't think of a thousand ways that person is probably a better person than I am. I think of one little thing and I get all self-righteous about it. What a good thing I'm doing. How come people can't be more like me? So the Pharisee, he's not praying at all. He's saying these words publicly so he can deliberately humiliate the tax collector. And he's doing it to make himself feel good. He gets a little joy out of feeling he's better than this guy. More pleasing to God. And here's another thing pride does. It feeds on comparison. Pride. And it keeps us comparing ourselves to people. That's what this Pharisee was doing. Comparing himself to this guy. And not only does he not like him. He says, the Pharisee says, I fast twice a week. I mean, that's interesting. Leviticus 25, 29 says, Is, Israelites were only required to fast once a year, a day of atonement. This guy's fasting twice a week. I mean, how many times is that a year? You people in the Mensa Society or whatever, you probably know the answer. 104 times. I mean, this guy's doing serious extra credit work. The Pharisee. Yeah. He's fasting twice a week. And he says, I give a tenth of all I get. Ten percent of all I get. He's fasting, or he's tithing on stuff he didn't even have to tithe on. For whatever reason, they weren't required to tithe on everything. Certain products like wine or grain or oil, certain produce. Like uh, things like celery. They didn't have to tithe on celery. I don't know why. I'm not making it up. I guess uh, they thought, well, God doesn't even like celery. <laughs> Nobody likes celery. Don't have to tithe on it. Nobody likes that stuff. I mean, he's doing serious extra credit work. And he's using the low spiritual reputation of the tax collector to make himself feel better. You might think hate's the opposite of love. I don't think that's accurate. I think pride stands as the opposite of love because the proud person looks down on everyone else. That's the opposite of love. And the Pharisee uses this low spiritual reputation of a tax collector to make himself feel better.
But he didn't have to in the temple. He didn't have to do that. You think about it. He could have seen the tax collector come in with the mass of people coming into the temple right then. He could have run right over to him. He could have given him a high five. He could have said, man, welcome. So glad you're here. So glad you're here for this service. I mean, I need it. I, maybe you'll need it too, but we're going to learn about a God who has created all of us and is loving and, and gracious and merciful to all of us. And I need this message. Maybe you do. And may, maybe we could make a deal. Maybe you pray for me, I'll pray for you. I mean, a Pharisee could have done that. He would have opened the door to everybody's heart to the tax collector who was there. He could have been a vessel of God's grace. That's the kind of thing God wants us to do. But he didn't do it. He didn't do it because he was devoted to his own pride, to looking good himself. And you know, a lot of sins are bad. They're devastating. I like what Ryan says. He talks about, you know, wounds and the woundedness and the woundings that we do through those behaviors. I like that. I mean, they're devastating. They can be. But sometimes people who are guilty of all kinds of sins, they can be very loving people at the same time. They can be. And that's just the truth. Pride is utterly, completely incompatible with love. It's like the opposite of love. And here's the irony. If you ask the Pharisee, if we ask the Pharisee, so how's your spiritual life going? He'd have said, great. You kidding me? My spiritual life is great. I went to temple today. Man, I went to temple. I'm praying. I'm fasting. I'm tithing. I'm, I'm doing extra credit work. God is so pleased with me. My spiritual life, it's tremendous, tremendous. In reality, he was attacking another person. In reality, he was violating love. He was poisoning his own soul. And he didn't even know it. He didn't have a clue. His church life looked great to him and to other people, but his real life was a mess. And what matters, really? What matters to Jesus? What matters to God? What matters to the universe is our real life. Our real life is what matters. So let me ask you, you, got any Pharisee inside of you? Got any Pharisee inside of you? Your real life, do you ever find yourself passing judgment on someone or get a little joy out of being critical or you find out somebody messed up and you feel a little superior about it? Yeah, me too. Me too. We have to look at this honestly. The other character in the story, the tax collector, tax collectors were universally hated in Israel for good reason. They were collaborators with Rome, collaborators with the enemy. Israel was occupied by the Romans. They were the enemy. Tax collectors were Jewish people, sold out their own people to make a profit with the Romans. They were understood to be very corrupt, very dishonest. This tax collector, we're told in the story, he stood at a distance in the temple that day. He separated himself from the people. But he did it because he was aware of what was inside of him. He knew what was inside himself, and he knew that he knew that he would be seen as a very dangerous person there. And his self-awareness and his wounding his brokenness produced deep humility in him. And in verse 13, Luke 18, it said he didn't even look up to heaven. No, heaven was a Jewish way of referring to God, expressing, speaking to God. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but beat his breast. The tax collector's making a desperate cry here. He beats his breast, an expression of extreme anguish. And he says, saying, my heart is wrong. My heart is wrong. My heart is wrong at the deepest level. My heart's wrong, not somebody else's. Not yours, not yours, not yours, mine, mine. And here's the truth. 
There's one, only one person whose depravity I have full access to, and that person is me. Me. That's why superiority is so, so those feelings are so lethal. Blinds us to the truth about myself. And here's what I'm learning. And this is good news. All I have to do when I get a dark thought like any of this stuff and other things, I recognize all I have to do is do what the tax collector did. I stop. I say the tax collector's prayer. That's the Lent prayer for this week. The tax collector's prayer. And you know what the tax collector's prayer is? God, I'm a mess. That's the tax collector's prayer. God, I'm a mess. I'm a mess. It's not the whole truth about me, but it's the truth. I'm a child of God. You're a child of God. You are loved by God just as you are. You're the crown of God's creation. Me too. But if I don't, if I, if we forget everything else, it'd be good to remember the tax collector's prayer. Because you're going to need it at some point in your life. Maybe this week. So let's, let's say it together out loud. The tax collector's prayer. Would you say it with me? God, I'm a mess. Hey, let's say it with enthusiasm. Let's say it like we mean it. With some excitement. Okay, here we go. God, I'm a mess. Yeah. Make sure you get the pronoun right. You don't go, God, you're a mess. No. Or don't look at somebody. God, you are a mess. No, this is, this is about me. Have mercy on me, God, is what we're saying. I need help. Have mercy on me. And God will say, I know. I know. I know all about you. And the Spirit will be right there with you, giving you a second start. Right at that moment. That's grace. And we live by grace. And the tax collector throws himself on the grace of God. He throws himself on the grace of God and Jesus goes, boom, story's over. And the two men go home. That's it. Pharisee who spent his whole life in the spiritual winner's circle. He goes home blind, unloving, a million miles away from God. He doesn't even know it. And the tax collector who spent his whole life despised, rejected. In the spiritual loser circle, the tax collector goes home. His heart is right. Things are right between him and God. Like verse 14 says, he's justified. He's forgiven. There never has been a more surprise ending ever. So which circle do you want to be in? Which circle do you want to be in? And I want us to take a few moments. I want us to take a few moments uh, before we even get into communion that we do every week. But let's take a few moments and just, before God, reflect on all this stuff. Everything that's been said, and maybe you'd want to bow your head and close your eyes, or maybe not, but allow the Spirit to work in your mind and your heart. And there's, if there's anything you need to talk to God about, any got any Pharisee inside of you, any pride, any judgmental, superior, critical spirit inside of you, any enjoyment thinking about some flaw of a person that comes to your mind. Just let God know and say, God, I don't want to be that kind of person. I don't want to be that kind of person. Bend my heart toward love. And just tell God right now and ask God to, ask God to bend your heart towards humility and give you a humble spirit. And as we come to the, then the communion table, you know, here at Crossroads, the communion table is open to everyone. Wherever you are on a spiritual journey or not on a spiritual journey, you are welcome here. Because we all live by the grace of God, all of us. In the communion table, uh, this is a serve yourself uh, 
communion set up that we do every week. There's stations in the front here, and we have them in the back. And You don't have to be part of Crossroads. I hope you caught that. Uh, this is for everyone. It's the Lord's table. It's not our table. And Jesus welcomes and loves and welcomes and accepts everyone just the way we are. So when you feel led to come, uh, you can come as the, as the band leads us in this song about the table, the table. And let me remind you, Jesus' body was broken for you and his blood was poured out for you. Let us come.